plant, a slaughter plant, a harvest facility, whatever you want to call it. Europe is called abattoir. You might want to use that keyword on some of your journal articles. Is we've got to make sure animals are unconscious before we get cut bits and pieces off of them. Uh, now, there's been some new research on it. It's really, really interesting. Just in the last two years, the really changes uh, sort of how to look at this. You have a situation where your animal is definitely uh, conscious, walking around, it's vocalizing, it's trying to write itself. Then there's a transition zone sort of between consciousness and unconsciousness, and then you have completely unconscious and brain dead. They better be in this zone before you cut any bits and pieces off where the brain is completely, completely glued sunk. Absolutely. Now, no matter what method of stunning you use, and I'm going to assume you've had basic meat science so you know something about captive bull stunning, electrical stunning, CO2 stunning, so I don't have to explain that. And you have religious slaughter where there's no stunning. This applies to all of it. If it's standing, it's obviously conscious. Okay, hanging out on the rail and it's trying to lift its head up. Yeah, that's definitely conscious. It's a writing reflex. Uh, it's mooing or squealing. Now, and now you see the eyes blinking. Now, you don't want to confuse blinking. There's a nystagmus that you can get, especially in electrical study where the eye just shakes. That's not blinking. Okay, so how do you learn how to make sure it's not blinking? Go out in the yards, look at the animal in the yards. Do you see it looking like an animal in the yards? Where the eye makes a complete sick, a complete cycle. That is blinking. I don't ever want to see that on the rail. I see that, you better immediately restun it. I I pursuit, that's hard to do in a plant. Most people don't do that. Now the menace test is, okay, make your blank. That's where you wave your hand in front of the eye without touching. So the eye is reacting to your hand being waved in front of it. And if you get any of these things, it's conscious. Well, you better be restarting that right away. I want to try to avoid, uh, you know, this problem. And then you have, it's definitely unconscious. Now, when you do surgery on you, say you had an operation, I've had two surgeries. Uh, the corneal reflex is where you touch the surface of the eye and it reacts. When you have surgery, you actually still have a corneal reflex. See, that's a primitive brainstem reflex. Or you touch the eyelash. See, the menace reflex, you don't touch. Another name for the menace reflex is the threat reflex or the blink reflex. One of the problems you've got in the literature is you're using different names for the same thing. It kind of varies depending upon the country. And uh, rhythmic breathing's got to be gone. When you watch the sights moving on that. Sometimes an animal may gasp, especially with electrical or CO2. That's not rhythmic breathing. It's this is rhythmic breathing. And the threat test without touching has got to be gone. Now, how did scientists in, in figure out what's going on here? They used brain waves, EEGs off the brain. So you need to see these papers are relatively new. They're only uh, research, probably did the research like two years, two, two and a half years ago. You know, that takes a while to get the research published. But it kind of, um, makes us learn a whole lot more. Then you've got an area in the middle where it's transition zone, where brain systems are starting to come back online. Now the Humane Slaughter Act, the way the law is written, it has to be uh, rendered insensible in a single blow. In other words, be perfect. And the USDA has been getting really, really strict and shutting plants down for doing second stunts. Well, if you do a second stun when they're in this zone, they probably never woke up. But what happens is brain systems come back online. It's sort of like a computer rebooting. And the first system to come back is the corneal reflex. And we'll be breathing, that's on the edge of the transition zone. And then the other things come back online, you're all the way conscious. So let's say I rolled an animal out of the box, a captive bull animal, and it had a very weak corneal reflex, so we shot it. I'm still legal on the humane slaughter. It didn't uh, wake all the way back up. It was, it actually, the way the law is written, <coughs> it is insensible to pain. 
And that's not the first system that comes back online. And if you look at human research, the first system that actually comes back online is hearing. We talk to people that they think was in a coma. They'll say things like, well, why did you play that horrible music all the time? You see, they were hearing. Did you feel pain? No. Pain's not the first thing that comes back online. And I've read some of the stuff on uh, things that uh, surgery patients remember from operations. It's sometimes it's auditory. So that's why in the operating room, you only say, well, she's a fat slob or some other thing like that, because a patient just might hear you. But the basic principle here is, is you have definitely all the way away from conscious. You have definitely all the way to pull it out. Then it's kind of a middle zone where systems are coming back online. Okay, or a gray zone. And there's a book out right now on people, I can't see it called the transition zone, the gray zone, where people are describing where they've been comatose. And there's a lot of stuff in there about auditory. And if you immediately shoot it again in the gray zone, you're probably still illegal. But it's not as simple as, I, it's not, it, it's hierarchical. And you get surgery done on you, the corneal reflex is still there. You'd be dead and wouldn't wake up from surgery. Okay, and before you start cutting bits and pieces off, you better make sure the corneal reflex is gone, period. Because that is the last system to go offline. Brains have reflex. And in cattle, the test for the corneal reflex, they got a great big eye. You can just touch the eye. But the problem that we got in pigs and sheep, they got a small eye. So then you got somebody with a big fat finger, and they go shove it in the eye like this. You can glue the eye shut, the mucus, and then a few minutes later it pops open, and you think the pig blinked, it didn't. It just kind of came unstuck. So on an animal with a small eye, let's get your finger out of their eye, you're gonna take like the tip of a pencil eraser or something like that and touch the eye. Because I don't want to be shoving the eyelid shut. I okay. Cattle, you can touch with your finger. Uh, small eyes, you know, touch the surface of the eye with something like the end of a pen, something just a blunt, smaller object. Okay, so this is a reason why I put this in here. I did a paper in 2001 where when I was working on uh, McDonald's audits, I made a mistake poking pigs with my big, with big finger, and I fooled myself. Uh, pigs were waking back up when they weren't. And that's where I learned, you know, keep the fingers out of their eyes. But before we cut anything up on him, we've got to make sure he's not coming back conscious. It's just like surgery. I've read some really hideous things in anesthesia literature where uh, people experience an operation. The worst case is when they give you a paralytic agent and no anesthesia. They experience the whole surgery, pain, and everything. It's absolutely, totally, completely terrible. Now, you basically have two methods of stunning. If you do a gunshot captive bolt, you can actually physically destroy parts of the brain. But CO2 and electrical do not physically destroy the brain. So you are going to have uh, a few animals that will have a weak coil reflex. You're not going to be able to totally get rid of it. Captive bolt, if you do it right, single shot, you can abolish the coil reflex. And if you're not abolishing the corneal reflex with a single shot, you better do something about your stunner. And one of the biggest problems with captive bull is people fail to maintain it. That is the number one problem. Just don't maintain it. Or you let the ammunition get wet. You can't store the ammunition out in some damp place. You're going to get soft shots. It's not going to work. All right, there's a full-fledged right reflex. The picture I took in South America. Not a nice picture. He's holding his head up. Because he's trying to get level with the, with the world. That's something you never want to say. Now, I can remember when the plants were really terrible. In the 80s and the early 90s. It was like there were no rules. It was completely disgusting. The industry now is so much better than what it used to be. There's just no comparison. Okay, there's a pig with a full arched back writing reflex. This is down in Central America. They take live pigs, hang them up, and just cut them. 
and he has a very nasty picture that's not from this country. So he's trying to write himself, and when they die, they go astray. So when you're testing insensibility in a plant, one of the things I want to look for is is your animal hanging nice and straight. Okay, here's sort of the order of return to sensibility. A corneal reflex, you're probably still in surgical anesthesia. Yeah, you better reshoot it because uh, rhythmic breathing's on the edge of this transition zone. And then the other things where the black print is, your animal is uh, he's conscious. And you start getting these other things. Uh, the menace threat reflex, that's a really good thing to do. Uh, you just wave your hand in front of their eye. You see, and they see the animals responding to motion of your hand. So your spontaneous blinking, that's a little bit lower down on the hierarchy uh, because it's not directly responding to a stimulus. Yeah, it's a hierarchy of systems coming back online. Okay, go out in the yards or go out on the ranch, whatever, pig farm. I want you to memorize what blinking looks like in light of animals. Whatever species you're doing, about the farm, and I don't want to see blinking when you do the full cycle. It's not the eyes shaking. I don't want to see that. You better, if you're going to be actually in the meat industry, you better memorize what that looks like. And the only way to learn that is just go out and look at live animals. And uh, and the spontaneous blinking, the blinking looks the same as it does in the menace reflex. The only difference is, is that the menace reflex is in response to the stimulus, where spontaneous blinking isn't. But I don't want to see the eyes actually blinking. And then you have methods that physically destroy big parts of the brain and methods that don't. And, and on methods that don't, like CO2 and electrical, it's almost impossible to completely abolish every corneal reflex. But if you get a corneal reflex, you better be stopped, period. Make sure it doesn't wake back up. Okay, agonal gasping, electrically stunned pigs, you'll see gasping, fish out of water, that's not really breathing. You will sometimes get a certain amount of that. You'll get that chickens too. And it's not the shaking eye. In captive bull cattle, you get a nice nystagmus, you better be stunned. It'll still be unconscious. Uh, because you always want her on the side of making sure it doesn't wake back up. We're not running a, a laboratory here, we're running a commercial plant. Uh, you're going to get some of this uh, gasping with electrical CO2 stunning. That's normal. Now, one of the problems you have with ribbing breathing is if the ribs just move once, I'm not sure I saw it. So, in the animal handling guideline, in the industry guideline, I actually worked on writing this. You can look it up on animalhandling.org. Animalhandling.org. Uh, on that guideline, it's got to move twice. And the only reason for doing it moving twice is you can't be sure you saw it otherwise. You see, when you're doing things, you've got to make sure you actually did see it. Uh, you can get some nystagmus. And there's a chart in the guidelines on animalhandling.org. Uh, the kind of things you can use to help you uh, uh, on, the, on the look at return sensible. There's a chart in there that shows the definitely unconscious and brain dead, the transition phase, and the fully awake conscious phase. Those are all in the document in animalhandling.org. And it's a free document. You can download it. I also have lots of stuff on grandon.com. It's my website, grandon.com. All right, let's review a few things. Uh, you need to have well-designed stun box. Big mistake people make is they make the stun box too wide. Other big problem is the floor is worn out and slippery. And if the floor is slippery, the cat will go like this. Doing these little tiny slips. And they're going to be jumping all around. Yeah, it's impossible to have good captive full stunning if the animal is jumping out around. Non-slip flooring. The other thing is a calm animal is easier to stun, period. So your handling matters. Also, from a meat quality standpoint, in that last five minutes you wreck the meat, you have to be squealing, jamming in the shoots, you're gonna get a higher lactic acid, more PSE meat, 
catapult and electric prodders a bunch of times, last five minutes, you're going to get more tougher meat. The biggest problem in captive bolt stunning is maintenance. I cannot say that word enough. You have to treat that stunner like the finest hunting rifle. It gets shot once in some little plant, you take it apart and plant them. You follow the manufacturer's recommendations and damp cartridges. Can't emphasize this stuff enough. Now, some places will use head holders, sometimes they'll use something a little elaborate, sometimes they'll use something less elaborate. But the bottom line is, you know, how well are you study. Now, on the NAMI, North American Meat Institute guidelines, there's a scoring system. And you can score how many animals did you render insensible with a single shot, but you didn't have to do a backup shot. The past, on the industry guideline, it has to be 96% perfect captive pull on the first shot. Also, you're measuring localization score. If you're squashing your head with that head holder, you're going to have cattle in there mooing their head off. And you're allowed to have 5% of them mooing in that box. The other 95% need to be silent. You go into a plant and it's moo, 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 and bella, bella, bella coming out of the stun box, you've got trouble. Let's get it fixed. The very sensitive indicator of something going on, like too much pressure from the neck, are you pinching them with something, or are you just keeping them in there too long? And then you can also measure prod score. You get them all excited in the back, they're going to be uh, hard to stun. This shows the center track restrainer system uh, in the big plant. This piece of equipment I developed. You know, people ask me what I'm most proud of. I'm really proud of developing this piece of equipment. That shows a Jarvis pneumatic air operated stunner. And you gotta remember, that is three pieces. There's three parts of the system. There's the stun gun itself, which is usually on a maintenance contract and well maintained. There's an air supply for it. That often gets neglected. And then they, you can see it's on a balancer because it's heavy. You know, ID things that, you know, you reel the ID card in and out. Well, a balancer works like a gigantic ID card holder and it balances that heavy gun. You have to maintain it too. So there's three parts, the gun itself, the air supply, and the balance. I cannot emphasize that enough. All three parts have to be taken care of. And sometimes the air supply has been neglected. Just recently, my students went into some plants and we found some little messes with the air supply. And I'm not gonna have time in a short class to describe everything wrong with the air supply. But it is a part of the of the stunner and it has to be maintained too. Okay, three parts of that stunner right here on this slide. I can't emphasize that enough. Okay, you can cut heads and half and see how good a job you're doing stunning with cat and pull. Now, if you're using a handheld stunner, uh, you will go right in and it will penetrate the brainstem. If you're using a Jarvis pneumatic in a restrainer system, it's still doing a good job of stunning, but it may not penetrate the brain stem. Okay, this is some pictures of my student took, Helen Klein, and uh, you know, you use Jarvis Maddox, extremely powerful. There's two things that make a captive bolt stunner work. The actual, you know, how much you penetrate the brain, but also the shock relief, how much concussive force. And the Jarvis hits it really hard, even though the brainstem may not be penetrated, uh, the animals are coming out dead, dead, dead. It's the way it should be. Okay, now it's gone. Okay. Uh, and I think the reason for not penetrating the brainstem is it's just on a slightly different angle. But the bottom line is, if you hang them up, I don't want to wake them back up. And you do a good job, Captain Goldstein, with gunshot, there should be no cardiac reflex on the first shot. Now you do a perfect job, electrical stunning or CO2 stunning, you're gonna get a few animals that will show a corneal reflex. Then you just shoot those animals. Because we gotta be very, very conservative. But from a humane slaughter law standpoint, if it only has a corneal reflex and you shoot it, it still is unconscious. So you evade the humane slaughter act. Okay, positioning, the center of the head. You're gonna see some different diagrams slightly different positions in the middle of the forehead. Uh, probably is not going to make that much difference. But the mistake people make, they just don't know any better, is to shoot it right here. That's not going to work. It is the middle of the forehead. 
and shape you might be able to do on the top of the head. She found an extremely thick frontal skull. There's a reason why rams are called rams. And they have a very uh, thick uh, skull in the front. And these diagrams are in the NAMI animalhandling.org. They're also in an ABMA humane slaughter document. They're in an ABMA euthanasia document. Easily accessible online and they are free. And the diagram's really nice. They can be copied and used for training. Okay, now some plants will use a non-penetrator. Non-penetrators don't work very well. Why would you want to use them? Only reason why somebody would use a non-penetrator is for religious slaughter. And I don't have time in a short lunch to go into all the reasons why. Uh, but they have to be put on absolutely straight or they won't work. And you have to bleed quickly because your animal can wake back up again. And, and when it works right, this is skin head, you're going to get a little dent in the head. You're going to have to do a little bit of damage or it's not going to do the job. I'm not a fan of non-penetrators. I want to try to avoid using them. But there's some situations where I have to use one and I have to be more careful about absolutely straight and absolutely uh, perfectly aimed. And if you've got Hereford with a mat of hair, that, that it's probably not going to work. I, I saw a really bad situation with that. Okay, non-penetrator. Uh, there's no margin of error. You have a powerful Jarvis nomadic penetrator. You can be, you know, if you hit within, you know, an area about this thing around, it's going to work. <coughs> non-penetrator. Your aim has to be absolutely perfect, and you need to bleed it in 60 seconds because it's much more likely to wake back up. This shows the animal riding on that center track restrainer system. And you've got to maintain the restrainer, too. It has a sharp edge in it. Your animal can start moving and, and bellowing. Every time I've heard loud moves come out, I found a reason for it. And it was often just a little sharp edge. Or you have a head restrainer that holds the neck, squeeze the neck too hard, they're going to be moving and bellowing. Well, then you fix it. I've gone in and I've just turned the pressure back and reduced the pressure and it fixed it. Vocalization is a really good score because when it goes up, you've got trouble. Every time I've gone into a plant that had high vocalization, I've fixed it. And, and now, unless I have a system where it's impossible to adjust the pressure without totally tearing apart the valves, I have run into some of those. They'll have to be changed. They'll have to change some of the equipment. This shows center track restrainer system. Details of design are important. Must have a non slip ramp going in. I've had situations where people have modified it and that didn't work. I, I have a lot of papers online going into more detail about behavior, but I have found things like lighting makes a big, a big difference. They don't like going in the dark, so I add a light on entrance, or I move a light to make a reflection go away, or I get rid of a paper towel dispenser that's just blowing like this. Uh, they'll go in air blowing back into the faces of your animals. It will not work. If somebody calls me up and they say my cattle and my pigs will not go into sunbox, first thing I'll want to check is air movement. Air movement, going back into the face of your animal, not going to work. Okay, electrical sign. Sometimes I'll use a beaver strainer like this. Both sides must run at the same speed or the pigs are going to be squealing. Now you have two types of electrical sign. You have head only, which is reversible. They'll use that lots of times for like a Muslim for halal slaughter. Because they want the animal to die by slaughter. Now if you use a head only stunner, it's truly reversible. You've just got a short time to bleed it. You need to get stuck within 15 seconds or to wake back up. Or you use cardiac arrest, where you simultaneously go through the brain and through the heart. Now an electrical stunning, you've got to cause a grand model epileptic seizure. So the electrodes have to be positioned to go through the brain. Absolutely, absolutely essential. Now, in electrical sign, in the seizure, you're going to have a rigid phase and then a kicking phase. And the reason why you have a kicking phase, the reason why animals kick when they're hanging on the rail of a walking circuit, right here in the spine. That's where the walking circuit is, it's right there. Now, when you shoot them with a captive bolt, the brain no longer controls the walking circuit and it goes crazy and you get this. Because the spinal cord will stay alive for about five minutes. And you have to cause a ground mal seizure with an electric sign. And you're going to have a rigid phase and then a kicking phase. 
So I'm going to kind of imitate this, but I'm not going to do the falling hook down part. So you go rigid. Then, then start to go. And then go like that. So you do a head only stunt, you'll get a very clear rigid face and then a kicking face. Head only. Uh, now, if you're using another type of stunner, you, want, you can put it right in behind the ears. That's going to work. But you cannot put it on the neck. Put it on the neck, it's going to bypass the brain. You might kill the pig, <coughs> but you're going to torture it. Now, the little plants that use this uh, best in Donovan, there's two little prongs like that. You can put it on the ear, put it right behind the ear. Behind the ear's okay. On the neck, no. So one of the things that we score for on the NAMI guideline, on animalhandling.org, is correct positioning. And the past industry audit for that place it correctly on 99% of the shape or the pegs. That just shows uh, uh, the best of Donovan with some extensions on it for the larger pigs. And in the little plants, you can stun the head with that and then immediately stun it here. So you're doing a cardiac arrest. But you've got to put it on his head first, then on here. Now when you stop the heart, it kind of messes up the seizure. You're not going to get the full rigid and kicking face. But you'll get what I call a ghost seizure. You'll still see a little bit of it. And I've, they've got to be able to demonstrate to me that they're causing epilepsy. These are just some simple little stun boxes for small plants. Okay, this is a head to back where you simultaneously knock out the brain and knock out the, uh, the heart at the same time. And you've got to get enough amperage through the peg to do it. Now, if I put this on for like two seconds, that's what most big plants do, I'll get a little bit of a ghost seizure where I can still see a little rigid phase and a kicking phase. Now, if I take a stunner and I put it on a pig for like 20 seconds, 30 seconds, then the spine gets fried and you won't see the seizure at all. So one of the ways I can test if the stunner works is I put it on for two seconds and I want to see a little bit of seizure action. Really important. Uh, this just shows applying it, uh, applying it behind the armpit. So you stun it here, then you do it here. Really, really simple. And the reason for doing this position instead of the middle of the back is to prevent damage. That's the position to do it in. All right, the red dots show the correct place, and the two arrows show how not to do it. And we need to make sure in university meets labs we're doing things right. The USDA has a website of shame. And unfortunately, there's a university meets lab on there. And since we're being videotaped, I'm not going to tell you which one it is. But it was pretty bad what they did. And uh, I, you can look at the two red arrows. I went to another university meets lab 10 years ago, and they were stunning pigs where the red arrows were. And after I watched two pigs stun wrong, I got the inspector over there, I got the manager over there, and so I'm going to teach you how to stun pigs. You see, this is something where just the basic principle of getting that electricity through the brain, they can understand that. Yes, that's a uh, prepared, uh, there's a head that's been split there. Yeah, the brain is not between the eyes. It's important to know where the brain is. You've got to get that electricity into the brain. And behind the ear is okay. Neck is not okay. Can't emphasize that enough. So how did scientists learn how to do this? You have to take the cordings off the brain. And then you can figure out what the brain is doing. Okay, now international standards for minimum amperages. Now, when this research was originally done, this was done on a 220 pound pig, or a European 100 kilogram pig. You're going to need more than this for our big pigs that are 280, a whole lot bigger. And, but this is a bare minimum. See, in electricity, Amperage is the amount of electricity. Volts is pressure. So if I got a water pistol and I shoot a really fine stream over there, that's high voltage, low amperage. When you open up the fire hydrant and it just blobs out, that's high amperage, low voltage. That's how a welder works. That's why you don't get fried with a welder, because the voltage is low. You got to induce that epileptic seizure. The rigid phase called the tonic phase. And the kicking phase calls the clonic phase. And on a head-to-back stunner, I still want to see some ghost seizure. 
So if I go into a plant and they fry a pig for 20 seconds, then I fry the walking circuit. So I want to check how that's done or works. I want to see it put on that pig for two seconds. You've got to demonstrate to me that you can cause a seizure. Now, a lot of people are over there looking at the meter. But I see people make fake meters. And the one thing they can't fake is the seizure. But, and then even with the head to back, I'll still see what I call a ghost seizure. I see a little bit of, little bit of this and a little bit of that. If I go into a plant zone electric sign and I see no kicking at all, I get a little worried unless they're really keeping it on for a long time. Another thing that's important is making sure the electrodes stay in firm contact with the amp. So if you put an oscilloscope on it to work with Neville Gregory, and you want it the whole time it's energized to be against the pig, not lifted prematurely and not energized prematurely. Because another thing that's scored is what they call hot one. So if you put the stun on the pig and it goes <laughs> right when you put it on, that's because you energized that one too quickly. Now these slides are on this computer. I'd recommend that you get them off this computer. And I notice you're videotaping this. It'd be nice to edit the slides in so they're not coming up real pale. They're on this computer. You know, get them off of there. Now these are situations where the wand was either energized before it was in firm contact, or they lifted the palm before it had gone through the site. Now you're not going to have this kind of equipment in the plant, but these are good things for training people on the idea of getting a full two-second stunt. Now let's look at things where electric stunning will not work. Dehydrated animals. It will not work. And that applies to every kind of animal. And you can't water them enough in the yards to fix this. This will have to be fixed back at the farm. And dehydrated animals. Another thing that can happen on electric stunning is there'll be a few pigs where that cardiac arrest doesn't work. So if you do a poor job of bleeding, that pig may wake up, do a really good bleed, make a big gusher coming out. We corrected a lot of problems in plants by greatly improving the bleeding. Poor contact, the animal wasn't wetted, and uh, the amp was just too low. Those are all things that may not work. Uh, all methods of stunning, kicking happens in unconscious animals. You can remove the head and still have kicking, because that's where the walking circuit is. Okay, hanging straight down, that's what I want to see. You see a limp, flaccid tongue, it's usually out. Now sometimes the tongue gets jammed up in the mouth. So if the tongue, it would be perfectly stunned. Now if I see that limp, flaccid tongue, I know I'm safe. But if I don't see it, I can't just automatically assume it wasn't stunned right. But if I see it, everything's good. When the tail stops wiggling, I know that the spine's dead. The tail will wiggle until the spine uh, uh, gives up. Pigs, the same thing, hanging nice and straight. Now, sheep have a big ligament right here in the right head. Sheep won't hang straight, they'll hang like this. But that head should be limp and floppy. The head should be like a rag. See, the only part of the animal you want to check to make sure it's insensible is a head. It's the only part that matters. Okay, I see that flaccid tongue. I know I'm safe. Okay, CO2, your animals are going to come out completely soft and floppy. Now, with captive bolt and electrical sign, con unconsciousness is instantaneous. It's like turning on a light switch, scientifically shown very clearly. CO2, it doesn't, um, it doesn't go unconscious immediately. Uh, obviously, there's a zero tolerance for uh, you know, cutting up anything showing any sign of sensibility. In the CO2 study, one of the advantages you can have is you have a really good handle. See, cattle like to line up in single file, pigs don't. And with these big CO2 study systems, you can handle the pigs in a group. So you get really, really super good handling for the pigs. But they don't go unconscious right away. Well, how's the pig feeling about it? As he gets anesthetized, that's going to vary. I'll tell you right now, there's genetic differences in how pigs react to CO2. Now, I like nice, objective ways to score things. So, it might be a good idea to have a window, put a camera down in there. Now, let's say the pig does a little bit of this, a little bit of that. That might be a fair trade off 
to totally eliminate electric products and get this really good blue panel. But he's trying to get out of the box and jump out the top of the box. No. So what does it do during induction? You're going to have the same questions for chickens. Okay, here's the um, really nice blue paneling. Cattle like to line up, pigs don't. And I uh, have an inspection port or a camera down in there. Uh, we need to look at what does the pig do. There's a giant fight in among scientists right now on gas mixtures. You know, I don't care what you use. Let's look at the outcome. I like nice, simple methods. What does that pig do? And a little bit of this and a little bit of that is probably a good trade off for the good handle. Where I can absolutely eliminate electric products. He's screeching and trying to jump out of the box. No. And there are genetic differences. And uh, we're going to be forced to look inside the box. There's going to be some pig genetics. It's going to have to go bye bye because we're going to have to fix it. Fortunately, in the US, most of that pig genetics is gone. You see, people have kind of avoided studying this. You know, sometimes people don't want to know about something. Okay, this just shows bringing most power gates. You've got to make sure you're not knocking things over the power gates. Absolutely not. In fact, the guy there right there is using a switch. When you have power gates in a system, you need to treat them like power steering. It's not automatic handling. And any salesman, salesman will tell you that. That's absolute rubbish. It's power steering. It's not automatic handling. 